I don't have a problem with answering questions about alcoholism because I think that it's such a huge problem for so many people and it's part of my, not duty, duty is too strong a word, it's part of my recovery process to allow people into that part of my life uh, and to own it and to, there might be somebody out there who is struggling, who might want some help, who will think, oh my God, that girl's an alcoholic, perhaps she can help me. So that's why I'm prepared to talk about it. When I first got sober, I used to um, think this was, you know, really not the thing I wanted to advertise to anybody, that I had this problem. And it's really turned out to be such a source of strength for me to know that I had this problem and to know that I could overcome it. How bad it got was the, the last time that I ever had a drink. It is the one that particularly stands out, not because it was the, the worst time, but just because it was the last time. And um, I had already been blacking out when I was drinking. Pretty much every time I drank, didn't really matter what I drank or there would be a period of time that I wouldn't be aware of what I was saying or doing or where I was. It's called a blackout. And that had been progressing and the time, the timings of the blackouts were getting longer. Well, it, it, it didn't, it neither made me a, it probably didn't make me a better actor, although it did kind of allow certain inhibitions, you know, to, you know, release. But I could never work having had a drink. I would always, you know, it was always after. But it, all, it also kind of uh, allowed my imagination also to, to let loose. So, I mean, so there, there are some good things about, about the alcohol, you know, it just kind of let, let me, freed me uh, of, of certain constraints and inhibitions that uh, were necessary to, to express myself without being shamed or feeling shame from my parents, you know, because my mother was always one to say, and, you know, being in the environment of uh, this kind of Irish Catholic, you know, you keep your head down, don't think too much of yourself, you know, and that, that kind of feeling. So, and of course, the, you know, they were, all, they were all drinking as well. Well, I think every time, every time I, I woke up or tried to wake up, and I just felt like I had a brick in my head, you know, and you know those things. Are, you know, of course, you know that's you think to yourself, oh, geez, I, 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 I got to back off for a while here, you know, and then the next night's the same thing, or, or not even the next night could be the next week. It doesn't, it, it wasn't like that all the time with me. I could drink socially, and you know, but as soon as I had enough, then there was no stopping, you know, and there was no limit, uh, except, you know, the time. I began practicing yoga out of a need. My need was that I used to be a singer. I used to uh, have to do a lot of, a lot of public performances, church mainly, choirs, concerts. And every time a performance came up, I would have a problem with my health. And uh, using all kinds of medications and all that to get the best voice on stage used to be a frustration. Then I was never a sports person. So after ordination, I also went into a completely non, no exercise syndrome. So that was telling on my health. And lastly, I'm not ashamed and, uh, to say this, that I come from a family of addictive history. So I was inclined to go into alcoholism.
I mean, I was six foot nine. Um, I remember being in the fourth grade and the desks came up to here on me. And I remember someone looking into the window saying, how many times has that kid been left back? I mean, I was this big at 13 years old. Uh, I always felt very uncomfortable in my skin. And uh, I was always looking for something to make me feel comfortable, to take away the unease or the, did they talk about disease or the dis-ease of self. And, uh, you know, it's much easier to come from outside substances to then, you know, as a kid, where do you pull it in from? I mean, unless someone's training you. And, uh, you know, my first substance, I guess, was food. Because I was very heavy. Uh, but I was shamed by other kids from being fat. And they'd say, look, he has breasts. And that was very embarrassing. Uh, and drugs and alcohol really uh, just, it was like a a zip line or something. It was just very easy to get into. Everyone was accepted. It was kind of the time. Timothy Leary, tune in, turn on, <laughs> drop out. I mean, it would have been nice if he told people, get your PhD first. <laughs> Telling 12-year-olds to do that isn't, uh, wasn't the best advice. Well, the first manifestation of addiction that, of which I became aware was uh, my extreme problems with money. Um, debting, using credit when I didn't have money to pay for things, uh, being completely unconscious about, uh, about my money, how much I had, how much I was spending, bouncing checks, getting into debt, uh, getting embarrassed all the time about money. Um, and um, so I started to address that through the 12-step program a long time ago, about 15 years ago now, I think. And. Um, then, through my recovery in that program, which has wafted and waned over the years, um, I became aware that um, I had that I might be sexually addicted. I didn't really think so at first, but I heard someone talk about his problems with sexual addiction, and I thought, oh, I really need to talk to this person because I was getting into some deep trouble. I think the way one perceives people who are uh, defining themselves as an alcoholic or an addict is that you tend to see them as somebody separate from yourself, somebody, you know, from a voyeuristic position. You're curious about their experience and the extremes that they've experienced. But really you very quickly see that we're all in the same boat, that we're all suffering one way from behaviors which we can't control. I'm uh, a member of Al-Anon, which is a, um, a program designed for family members uh, or relatives of alcoholics. And uh, to qualify as a member of Al-Anon, you basically just need to have had some experience in dealing with alcoholism in your life with a close relative or friend generally. One of my uh, uh, attempts in the programs to try and identify why I got in a relationship with an alcoholic since I couldn't identify alcoholics in my own family. The program doesn't require you to identify the, the root of your behavior, but you know, because of my way of thinking, uh, my logical mind, I, I tend to do that. And what I've noticed about myself is that certain aspects of my relationship with my parents, and my mother in particular, may have led me to uh, be susceptible to being in a relationship with someone who was uh, not healthy for me. And normally people would know how to get out of that relationship, but my inability to get out of it kept me pro you know, in, in the relationship for a prolonged way, a prolonged you know, time. So it's not that I necessarily sought out alcoholism, but when it came into my life I didn't know how to uh, move away from it. I came to AA about seven years ago, I'll be seven next week, and um, I didn't want to be in AA. And I came to AA because I was in a psychiatric hospital where I'd had an, uh, a breakdown. And I was diagnosed by this doctor that I found myself in his office in bits, and he said, 
you're an alcoholic and you're probably a drug addict and you need to come in and sleep. I hadn't really slept for about, I don't know, six or seven months. And uh, so I went into his hospital primarily for a week to sleep. And uh, at that point, I didn't know, I hadn't really taken on board. I think I knew that I was an alcoholic, I knew I was drinking alcoholically, but I didn't think that I was an alcoholic, if that makes any sense. And after about six or seven weeks in the hospital, I uh, got bored of all the other patients who were mostly people who had had breakdowns for other reasons and so I went to AA. He said to me, I want you to go to AA, so I went to AA and uh, it was everything I thought it wasn't going to be and uh, it was an amazing experience and from that day on for the next three and a half years I went every day to, to an AA meeting. Uh, it was bad enough for me, and I stopped comparing my bottom to other people's in terms of AA. I might compare it in terms of how big is my bum, but uh, I, I do think that for me, I've been really lucky. I had a rock bottom. It was serious enough for me to take it really seriously, and I haven't relapsed, so I haven't had a drink since that day. And I do think that if you don't experience that kind of drastic situation or intervention, it it can be quite difficult to do the steps necessary to stop drinking. And rock bottom is a basic realization that I don't have to deny who I am. I am who I am and it's beautiful the way I am. I also hit a realization that these games were counterproductive and they are going to take me into a spiraling pit where I will self-destruct. That awareness that I, I can't live on the periphery anymore like this. I need to stop this. And uh, another thing that was characteristic of my using and drinking was I, I didn't ever really end the night with the same people that I started out with. It was somehow I wound up with a whole different crew or with a, with a, with a different person than I began it with. So that all was going on this evening. But the thing that really stood out about this particular night, Lindsay, was um, that I, I couldn't explain to the person that I was with where I lived. Because I was in a relationship with my mother, and you know, what, what can one do? One's a child, one can't get out of that relationship. So one learns to adapt to it. And I, I, the inability to tune out. And so no matter how much I got screamed at by either my mother or by my first long-term relationship, because there was a lot of screaming, I, I could pull into the shell of not hearing. And it would be like I'd be looking from within my body through eyes that were at the end of long binoculars. And they were an outer shell and I was inside protected. And that's how I would feel when I was being screamed at by somebody for reasons that didn't seem justified to me. Well, I had a really big, uh, I, I overdosed in my apartment and my mother had this really bad feeling and she removed the hinges off the door of my apartment and I was blue. She took me out, I was 26 and uh, they took me to the hospital and I was pronounced dead and uh, I had an adrenaline shot. I didn't even know it was until I saw the movie Pulp Fiction. I came to a couple of days later, I had two huge black and blues on my chest. But I was drinking all the time, I was doing drugs you know, at 385, 400 pounds, I always had black and blues. I didn't really think anything of it. And they said I had an adrenaline shot. And then I realized an adrenaline shot in your chest, you know, was a long needle going into my heart. And uh, I looked into a 12 step program and I remember going to a meeting. I mean, I was 26 at the time. It was like, it seemed like a bunch of 40 year old guys in trench coats. I said, what a group of losers these are. And, uh, you know, I thought I could do it on my own. You know, that own self-reliance of, I could do it on my own, and I didn't need anybody else. 
I think that's a big part of uh, most addicts want to do it on their own or just can't even ask for help. Then I think I was too uncomfortable to ask for help or not knowing what help was. And it kept me out for years on my own preconceived knowledge of what programs were, what 12-step programs were. I can remember when I went to my first meeting to deal with the overeating. I went to that program and um, on the way there, I started to talk to myself and I said, why are you doing this? You don't really want to go into another 12-step program. You don't really want to do this. And um, I was just really trying to convince myself to turn around and go home. And then suddenly I realized how many hundreds of times I had tried to approach this problem through my own efforts. And I said, Yo, you know, Jack, you're not going to recover by yourself. You're not going to get better by yourself. You never have. Just keep going. So I went to my first meeting. In 1984, I, had, I, had, uh, I was doing a, a piece with, at the, what was then the Quaig Theater. With, and with these uh, three short short plays by Yeats, and um, or two, and uh, I met another uh, person uh, who since has become a yoga teacher, and uh, and uh, she she noticed, you know, that I wouldn't just have a glass of wine after the rehearsal, you know. I had a, you know, a 12 ounce glass that I grasped like a gun barrel, you know, uh, and it was just, and she said, hmm, she said, you know, my, so we, we became friends and, and, and friendly and uh, she says, you, 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 you might want to take a look at this. And I says, what do you mean? Well, I said, you know, you come to rehearsal, you smell like a, like you've been out all night, you know. You know, those pheromones, you know, when somebody said, you know, has, was tanked up the night before, you know, this stuff just reeks out of you. And you don't, you don't smell it, but everybody else smells it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I says, what do you mean? She says, well, I know exactly what you're going through. Because, uh, you know, I've, I'm in the program and this is the way it is. And, and so she took me to my first meeting. So I went to this other rehab in Miami, <laughs> and I was told it was a happening rehab. And I said, wow, what makes this happening? This is well, Madonna's boyfriend's here. I said, oh, really? I said, yeah, he's really happening, and he's in the rehab. And I said, well, I'm kind of happening. I mean, I was 400 pounds and a junkie, so I know how happening I was. But they said, you know, he's happening, you're happening, why don't you come to this rehab? <laughs> so. Uh, I went to this rehab and it was, it was just terrible. You know, I thought I'd be drinking margaritas on the beach, which I still didn't really think I had that much of a problem. Uh, I thought it was everybody else that was my problem. And the kind of joke is, you know, I don't have any problems until I meet other people. So <laughs> I'm going to stay in a cave, I'm fine. And so I went to this rehab in Miami and, oh my God, you know, it was horrible. I was just like strapped to a plastic bed, screamed, cried, and uh, detoxed. And, uh, you know, the whole thing of uh, when I got some time, you know, just to get the drugs out of my system. So it took probably 30 days. And uh, they would bring different 12-step meetings in every day. And I was thinking, well, this isn't a bad job. You know, I didn't realize it was voluntary. You know, I thought they were getting paid to do that. I said, well, you know, maybe I could do this. <laughs> No, oh, I had difficulty stopping drinking. I, I mean, I, in the hospital, they wouldn't even let me hold anything that was slightly like a wine glass. Um, I, I mean, for the first, I think it was about five or six weeks, I didn't really leave the hospital. But when I did leave the hospital, I could not look. If I went anywhere, I couldn't look apart from where my feet were going because I was terrified about seeing pubs or bars or shops that had bottles in them because it would just freak me out because I just wanted to have a drink. 
if I went to a restaurant, which I did much later on, I don't know, three or four months sober, it just that, I remember sitting in a restaurant and this woman had this glass and she was drinking and I was just like that, my stomach was going, I was like, ah, ah. I just wanted her drink. And if people talked about drinking, I felt like it's not fair, what about me? And I can't do that, well, I'm never gonna drink champagne and I'm never gonna, you know, it was just, I felt like I'd lost my best mate. I thought I'd lost my friend, I thought I'd lost my lover, I thought I'd lost, yeah, you know, I could do life if I had a drink. If I didn't have a drink, what was I supposed to do? When I first started AA, and I, I was coming from a place of being quite disgusted with myself, reach, having reached a point of really quite um, damaged self-esteem. And I, I, I surrendered to the program literally with the thought, it's okay if I never have fun again. It's gotten that bad, that it's really okay with me if I, I guess I'll just never have fun again. I've always had a Valium or something, and to just have nothing in terms of a substance just was such an uncomfortable feeling that uh, I probably went to three meetings a day. Go to one in the morning, or two in the morning, one in the afternoon. Probably made 300 meetings in my first 90 days because it was the only place where I kind of felt safe. You know, they say, I mean, everyone has their own thing, 90 meetings in 90 days, well, that's great. But I mean, it, was, it wasn't enough for me. You know, I'm an addict. It was the only place I felt comfortable. Um, <laughs> I laugh because people say, why well, aren't you worried about being brainwashed? I'm saying, if I could take my brain out and put it in a bucket and like, shake out all the garbage in my head, I'd love to do that. I said, please brainwash me. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want what I have. I mean, it wasn't helping me. You know, what was in my brain was certainly not positive, it was toxic waste. How do you get it out? Or at least getting it into a positive flow? The being pissed and being drunk was horrendous. The getting sober was even more horrendous. Getting sober was horrendous because it was like for the first time in my life, since I was a teenager, I had nothing to smoke and nothing to drink. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to be in the moment. I mean, I still have problems with that, but I could only think about it forever. How am I gonna get on an airplane? How am I gonna have a birthday? What am I gonna do about Christmas? What am I gonna do when I go to a restaurant? How am I ever gonna laugh again? How am I ever gonna have sex again? I'd done none of those things without drinking. So I, I just thought my life was over. And I, um, I hear lots of people say that they get their emotions back. I already had my emotions because I spent the last sort of four or five years of my drinking sobbing, sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. I was a daily drug taker, a daily drinker and a daily crier. And that only got worse when I came in. I mean, I, that psychiatric hospital, I wrapped myself in a blanket and I cried for three months is what I did and went to AA meetings without the blanket. Came back, got in my blanket and just kept on crying. So. I just, you know, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. In the program, when a person comes into the program, they're not, they're not receptive to complex ideas. You got to keep it simple. And that's the basic, that's one of the basics, right? You keep it simple, keep it simple stupid. Because you're stupid. You sit down, right? We love you, but you're stupid. You sit down and you listen. And then, and then you start to clear up. You start to clear up a little bit, then you can say, well, how's your body? How are you feeling in your body? Because you have to detox. You have to get this stuff out of your system. And then you start to feel good. Your energy starts to... And sometimes when you detox, after a few months, after three or four months, then there's a surge of energy. And you say, why don't you go take a class? Why don't you find out what to do? Why don't you go running, you know? What did you used to do? You used to play ball? Go play ball, you know? My first reaction to a meeting was I was incredulous at the in deep honesty that people were burying their souls in a room full of strangers, that people would feel that trusting and that comfortable to say these really 
intense, describe really intense feelings and um, things they had done or said or that, that, I think that's what really made me feel so comfortable right away. It was like, wow, well, if they can do it, <laughs> maybe I can too, you know, and just to see this, the, um, all the variations of the people in the meeting from young and old and black and white and gay and straight and rich and poor and just the, and everything in between and everybody was the same and that was really um, profound for me to see yeah. how everyone was just the same. I think when people hear people talk about their recovery and the things that they did because the stories can be so amazing and so magical and so interesting that they might be scared but they can actually be really inspired to get their own house in order. I think it's different when you just read about them or you see them on the wall in an AA meeting. Then I think it's quite terrifying because you haven't got any anecdotes to attach to it. But I think once you talk to somebody, I mean I've heard people making the most amazing amends and you just are filled with admiration for their bravery and their courage. And then you see the sparkle in their eye that they get from having a completely free conscience. That's really what 12 step is about. It's enunciating your own experiences and let, letting others take what they will and leave the rest. In fact, that's what we say. Take what you will and leave the rest. So whatever you say, they can identify with every piece of that. They want to or none of it. So you offer your experience out for the taking. It's not, it's not offering it in an advisory way. I felt at home. I felt, you know, we're all, we're all on the same page here, and it's not about the externals. You know, there was something that everybody that I was listening to, everybody was saying, and I go, uh huh, yeah, I I get it. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. I feel the same way, yeah. I thought I was all alone. Nobody, yeah, I, I identify. And that, and that opened something in me that, that gave me a little bit of hope. And I go to AA and I can say to somebody without feeling like a bloody idiot, what do I do with this? How do I handle this situation? And I get the most amazing advice without the ego because they haven't got an interest in me. They're not trying to manipulate me because they know the characters or the stories. So it's, it's like my family, but it's like the biggest family in the world and it's just full of love and it is the most amazing organisation. It is community, like you just don't get anywhere else. The success rates of 12-step programmes are uh, always in question, people are always bringing that up. The thing that 12-step programs do is they get people to stop, which is the critical thing. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, people that got me even more interested in this subject than I am now was Father Joe Pereira, who uh, in India uh, heads up uh, 41 uh, facilities that are dealing with people uh, who are addicted, who, you know, suffering from some kind of substance abuse, and some people are kind of have have uh, you know addiction-related illnesses like HIV, things like that. And um, he's a Catholic priest, and for I think about 20, 25 years, something he's been running these institutes, these institutions based on uh, the work of BKS Iyengar and yoga, right? So he's not only a Catholic priest. He's a, a very advanced yoga practitioner and he's had 25 years experience of dealing with people, treating them right from the very beginning with yoga. Right? So they come in, they start 12-step, they start yoga, they start other things. But he has uh, uh, evidently a success rate of something like 60%. It is a fact that when uh, certain human beings are suffering, not only from addiction, but from any ailment that uh, alienates them from society, makes them marginalized, uh, they receive two responses. 
One is a common person's response, which is aversion, which is exclusion. And the other response is understanding, love, compassion. I think in the world, you get people of both kinds. I think treating other people better, being compassionate, is an important thing to, to learn how to practice. And I've tried to, to do that more truthfully. Um, I have a long way to go. I'm, you know, I'm no Mother Teresa. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But then who is? <laughs> and uh, I, I really choose my staff accordingly that I, I don't like too much of heavy professionalism in my work because we don't need professionals. We need what we call wounded healers. People who have gone through this suffering themselves and can vibe with the others. How would I describe a 12-step program? Well, first of all, let me make a disclaimer that I can't I don't feel like I can uh, be a spokesperson for any program, but so I'll just tell you my personal experience is that um, first of all, the program is a uh, it's a stopping ground for someone who's who is running. <laughs> it's a place to stop and just say, well, wait a minute, my life is unmanageable. That's the first thing. You have a sense that that what you're doing is just not working and will never work and you're running yourself. The first step was literally the, f the first step, which is uh, that we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. And for me, um, you know, they, they recommend that you start working with a sponsor. They ask you to find someone in the program, a 12-step program, who has gone through the steps and has a greater amount of time than you to help you through the steps. And so I did that and that first step was the one that they told me I had to do perfectly. It was just the other ones they said, you don't have to do the rest perfectly, but you have to get this first one. You have to really admit that you're powerless. You have to really know it and really feel it and really admit it that you're powerless over alcohol. I didn't understand step one at all. I didn't understand that I was powerless. I understood that I was unmanageable, but the powerlessness, I was like, I don't really know what that means. I kind of felt when they talked about the first step of I'm powerless, I thought powerless meant uh, you might as well do it because you have no power. I didn't realize don't do it. <laughs> I just kind of thought, well, if I'm powerless, what am I fighting this for? I mean, I just might as well keep going and I didn't understand what that meant. And I mean, <laughs> the joke of there's no f phrase, figure it out. I mean, ask somebody, you know, it's a, it's a we program, not a figure it out program. And I was trying to figure it out and you just can't. The step one was, uh, yeah, it took, me, it took me a while to get my head around that. But the unmanageability, my life was completely unmanageable. You know, I had, a very high-powered job in an advertising agency that was way beyond my means. I blagged my way into this job and was not coping with it at all well. And I lived in this flat that I'd bought that I'd completely gutted and I had a blow-up bed on the floor and a couple of bin liners of clothes and a TV and some hi-fi, nothing else. Didn't have any running water or a kitchen. I mean, I had a bathroom, but I didn't have a kitchen or anything. And I would come home and drink and take drugs and stay up all night playing loud music, talking to myself, and then kind of try and rummage around in the black bin line as looking for something clean to wear, and then get a taxi in the morning, because I'd had one or two hours sleep to work. And then the process would continue the next day. I would score on the way home, buy a drink on the way home, come back to this flat. For me, it was a struggle in the beginning. I could see how I was powerless because I could literally see, oh, I wouldn't want to drink, but I would do it anyway. And that seemed so, so clearly powerless to me. But I, I, was, I had a much harder time accepting that my life was unmanageable because it, it felt like 
it was pretty manageable, even though it wasn't. <laughs> but it, it took me some time to get that second part of the first step. You know, I think of, uh, I mean, the only time I seemed out of control when everybody around me was saying, you know, you're a disaster. But, uh, I mean, as an addict, I always thought uh, I had it completely under control. And uh, why were people just bugging me? You know, I was like, just give me a break. I guess I'd admitted that I was powerless over alcohol without really understanding that I'd admitted it. But I'd admitted that I had a problem with alcohol when I spoke to the psychiatrist for the first time. He was probably the first person I was ever honest with about drinking, how much I was drinking and how many drugs I was taking. I'd admitted the drugs to some people and I'd admitted the drinking to others, but I hadn't put the two together and gone, this is what I'm really doing. And he was the first man I did that to. Give you a very simple, uh, you know, example. The denial syndrome is a big one in recovery. A guy comes and says, yes, I want to get well. What is the degree of his motivation? Who can judge that? By his yes that comes from his lips or from his, well, as I say, from his head level. Even if he may be very honest from his gut level, who is going to judge that? What is the way you can judge that? Yoga. You can't, the body never tells lies. So, truth, encounter with truth, and the very first step, yoga helps. And that is why we have a set of restorative postures, which calms down the persons, kind of brings about a hypometabolic effect. And that leads that person to say, to oneself, you know, that I am all right. I am all right. Deep down, I am all right. And just, you know, they talk about denial. Denial really means you don't even know you're lying. You know, that's what denial is. It's not like you're trying to kick people. Denial is you don't know it. I mean, it's, you know, you could pass a lie detector test. Denial is causal. Denial. It's a, it's a kind of, it's something that doesn't solve itself. It doesn't give you any solutions to figure out how to face what you don't want to face. When people are challenged with a health problem as addiction, and they do acknowledge in the first step of the program that helplessness, by that helplessness, they are led into a hope of a healing process. That healing process has to be recognized as a power higher than their ego. I had a male sponsor. He was very, very good. And he took me through the steps, and I did a, a massive step one with him. Right. Huge step one with lots of written work. And I think it was then that I fully understood what my issues were. Because I don't think that my issues were just drinking and alcohol. I think they were a symptom of my issues. And what, what he taught me to do, or what he showed me to do, was to look at all the areas of my life that were not working and why they weren't working. In step one, I was asked to list in a very particular way all the problems I had in, in a whole range of areas, which were things to do with my emotions, my finances, my relationships, that sort of thing. And in step two, I was asked to look at all of those issues and to replace them with sane thoughts and sane processes. So it's like, I'm a piece of shit, no one loves me, I'm really unhappy, it would be replaced by, oh, I, I'm really valuable, I'm doing an amazing thing by getting sober, and I know that people really love me. So I matched everything up, so it was like, it, it gave me the sanity. I actually had to list out what being sane was. 
And, and that was a, a hugely powerful thing, actually. The hope comes in in the second step when faith is expressed. Came to believe that a power higher than myself can restore me eventually to sanity. That's my hope. The way he made me do it was he made me put all the negative stuff on one side, fold the paper and then all the positive stuff on the other. Right. And, and, and the combination of that really made me see how insane my thinking was. Because on the, on the left hand side was nothing but self-hatred, vile, angry bullshit. And on this side, it was like, oh my God, of course, you know, a God or whatever, the universe doesn't really think that about me. My family doesn't really think that about me. It's my interpretation, it's my perception. And that is insane. That I'm allowing my life to be controlled by this negative bullshit in my head. Right. It's just what I say, you know, it's like, how, how can I be happy, joyous and free when I know I'm gonna fuck it up, you know? I'm, I'm going to blow it. You know, that voice inside there, keep your head down, Kev. You know, take the end run. You know, get by. You know. An addict generally is a confused person with regard to love. As the famous existentialist Martin Buber said, we are all born for love. And as he defined love, love is an I-thou relationship, I-you relationship. An addict has missed it. Either actually missed it or he has by his own, she or he has, has misunderstood. I've got a lot of cases where addicts were born in very loving homes but they never saw themselves as being loved. So either actually not loved or perceived as not loved leads them to get a substitute. A substitute for an I-thou relationship there are many in the world. It is called an I-it relationship. And I think there's something in the alcoholic that is in this loveless debate. You know, is it possible? Can people love me? Can I love myself? What does that mean to love myself? How can I love myself when, when there's no connection to um, another human being, you know? So the environment of the, of the process in, 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 the, in, this, in the program is that there's, it sets up this process of, of, of allowing someone to love you, you know, even in just the practicality of call me, you know, how are you doing? Come on with me. Don't. Don't go there, come here. Yoga practitioners and recovery people. Before they came into this practice, will admit that they were soaked in lies. And a human being is made for the truth. Going to meetings, working the steps, with a sponsor and then eventually you become a sponsor and you work with other people who are new and guide them through the steps and it's through this this entire process that you can't help but run into yourself you can't help but <laughs> you can't help but be confronted with yourself if you're sharing honestly So step three, which is make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Uh, I love that step. It is my favorite step because I am a control freak. And I always thought that I could change whatever as long as I went like that. I went my whole life doing that, hanging on, clinging on, pushing. And uh, this let me off the hook, step three completely let me, let me off the hook of that. I'm like, I'm not in control. I, I can't, you know, it doesn't matter how much I do, it's already predefined. Somebody else is in charge, let them have the control. I just didn't want it anymore, I couldn't do it. I was too exhausted to try and take a hold of my life. So I was only too willing. I was quite um, 
my sponsor it was American, so he was into that whole kind of, you know, I was thinking of Americans as being quite sort of ostentatious with their emotions, and so he made me do it in public, in this go secret garden in Regent's Park, where I had to get on my knees and say it out loud, and then he had to hug me, and we had to make this big thing of it, so I felt a little bit inhibited about doing it, but I did do it. But it wasn't like a, lun a thunderbolt. I know some people go, just go, Phew. I think I was too riddled with um, my shyness to allow any thunderbolts that might have happened. I mean, you really have to put down uh, your ego for that stuff because it's easily, you know, you could be embarrassed. And they say, you know, you can't save your ass and face at the same time. Surrendering uh, to a higher power which means letting go of the concept that they can control the circumstances in their life. Like I let go of the cir circumstances related to my controlling my lover's life and what he was going to do. Letting go of that concept is the first step towards freedom. Well, what was happening to me and, and why uh, dealing with a higher power was an issue was that I had, after s numerous false starts, with uh, with recovery and uh, and failures, at, I would say at it, <clears throat> I became aware, or beca I became convinced that um, doing the steps, working with the steps, was the way to recover. I noticed that people who really stayed sober and and, and had commendable sobriety were people who worked the steps, so to speak. I didn't even know what that meant. But um, so when I started that process with my sponsor, who encouraged me to do that, I realized right away I was going to have difficulty with God. Because, you know, my background is it's extremely religious. I came from a fundamentalist religious background. And I had gone through stages where I had just given, had renounced religion completely, and was really quite angry at it. So um, it was just a problem. My sponsor said, he said, here's what I encourage you to do. Here's what I do. I encourage you to do this. Every night when I, before I get into bed, I get on my knees and I thank God for keeping me, and I ask God to keep me sober through the night. And then every morning when I get up, the first thing I do is get on my knees and ask God to keep me sober throughout the day. And I said, I can't do that. I just can't do that. And I tried it, and it made me sick because it just instantly brought me back into that whole uh, context of church, fundamentalist church, and people, you know, down at the mourner's bench, people thumping you on the back and praying you through confession and all that. And, and it just made me angry and f furious. Um, but everybody was saying it, all my sponsors and all my programs. And <laughs> so I knew I had to kind of deal with this. So I started working on the steps and I wrote about my feelings about higher power, about God and so forth. It occurred to me that if I could start my day with a yoga practice, and then I don't remember if I thought of this or I just discovered it, but the, 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 the practice of getting on your knees, that's one of the first things I did in my class. There I was on my knees with my head on the floor prostrated. And suddenly I realized, oh, I can, I can pray here. And so that became a wonderful ritual. It became my entree into, into my day. I think the most important thing to get across about me is that um, yoga, the practice of yoga, enabled me to approach higher power. Without the yoga, I was stuck. The first three steps are related to turning one's will over to a higher power. So. If you are interested in the philosophy of yoga, if you can get to that place, some people can start with that, some people can get there after years. But if you're curious enough to read the philosophy, some of what, something in the philosophy of yoga, then you'll see that one of the things that helps one to reveal one's true self to oneself, to see one's true self, one method that Patanjali, who is, you know, and the sages of yoga has recommended is surrender to a higher power, Ishvara Panidana, so that your whole being is absorbed in the experience of 
this higher power. That's probably the path somewhat of what we call bhakti yoga, bhakti yogis, you know, devotional love to a higher power. The step four is more a uh, psychological tool. Do you know, do you know what it yeah, is? Yeah, uh, made a searching and a fearless moral inventory of all our misdeeds. So that is a cleansing process which if you have the gift of honesty, truthfulness, which you get through the discipline of yoga and uh, then you sit down and do this laboratory, personal laboratory of inner cleansing, you can get the capacity to be truthful about it, about the past, made a searching and fearless moral inventory. For me, step four was fantastic. It was a great way to kind of beat myself up. It's like, I know. Step four is... Step four made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. You know, well, I spent my whole life taking a moral inventory of me, you and anybody else. So it was a great way, self-flagellation, you know. I, I was like pages and pages and pages of all the hatred and anger and bitterness in my head. You know, I heard one person share that, that her sponsor stopped her from doing it. He said, it's just too much. And I so related to that. I mean, he didn't stop me, but um, it was easy to do. Eventually it gets really boring because you're writing this stuff out like that. And you're like, this is the same stuff. This is the same stuff about this person that I felt about this person and this person and that person. And it becomes incredibly boring. The first thing that hits a human being in a, any recovering program is the truth about themselves. Whatever that may be, the person has the humility. And humility for me is truth. Before you can see the truth if you are in any way filled with ego. And both the 12 steps and the yogic discipline Truth plays a major role there. So that's my encounter with truth. For me, the first three steps were really connected to yoga in a very strong way. And I was fascinated by them. And Al-Anon then came back and helped me get out of that relationship by taking action. And um, all of that, of course, is, you know, anyone who studies yoga philosophy understands the relationship between taking action and meditation and seeing the right path for oneself and differentiating between good perception and poor perception of things. When, when people do yoga poses, they, they have to know whether they're doing them accurately or not. They have to know, is it true that I'm straightening my leg? Is it true that I'm straightening my arm? Is it true that I'm doing some movement which is required in these poses? And that constant self-assessment, that constant self-observation in relation to the truth, develops somebody's capacity to adhere to the truth. Um, that becomes very important when one's dealing with one's own emotional, mental activity. It's the, that's a harder thing to evaluate, harder thing to be true about, one's own intentions. And so um, yoga supports 12-step programs in that way, in that it's giving somebody a very practical way of not getting in, getting too caught up in their imaginary process and it keeps, a, keeps their feet firmly on the ground in terms of what's real and what's not. I've always thought of yoga as being really boring and the people that do yoga is incredibly naff, vegetarian, hippie type people. And uh, a, a kind of, not family member, but uh, a, an ex-boyfriend's sister-in-law said, I've got this yoga that you'll love, come with me. And I went with her to a yoga session and I did love it. And so uh, she just thought, hmm, I think she might like this yoga. And of course I went, fell in love with it and immediately was like, when can I come again? One of the teachers in my studio gave a workshop on uh, tapas. And so I looked that up in the, in the book about the, the sutras of Patanjali and it said tapas are, means um, burning up of impurities through practice, or at least that's one way to describe it. And I was mesmerized by, by that concept because I thought, ah, you mean I could work on these, the problems I have that make me addicted 
by my practice. And it just it clicked that yoga was going to be the way that I was going to, uh, that I was going to move through uh, my, my recovery from addiction. In this rehab in 1993 that I went to, after 10 years of trying to figure it out, I went to a couple of different rehabs. I finally went to one rehab that uh, I mean, it was such a mess. I mean, I was coming off a couple of different types of substances. And uh, this really sweet uh, yoga teacher came in. And, uh, you know, the people who wanted to would do a class. Um, I mean, it was, I didn't even realize it was chair yoga. We'd sit in chairs and, you know, try to do triangle pose or uh, just really basic stuff. And there, I didn't feel any feeling of judgment or there wasn't any feeling of, you know, you're not really doing it right. Or she was just so accepting and just a, really, just a beautiful feeling. She had this cute little accent. She's from Australia. And um, that was my first experience to yoga. You know, just doing, just trying to touch, touch your toes sitting in a chair. So yoga came into my life around uh, six or seven years after I was in recovery. I, I got in recovery when I was 18 and I began I began yoga when I was 25, and a friend's um, mother did a headstand at a party, and it was really inspiring to me. She was in her late 60s, and she was so steady and beautiful to watch her do this unusual thing, you know. And my friend was doing yoga also. I had some friends doing it, and I thought that it's it was it really piqued my interest. So I signed up, and I went to a free class. And right away, I had a profound um, experience with the yoga practice. It felt really, I felt really at home. The same way I felt when I went to AA meetings. I felt like, oh, I found something that really makes sense. Then the 11th step is nothing but yoga, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, seeking only the knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Step 11, which is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, which is my yoga step. Yoga really helps me with that because it is about coming back into myself and into my body. And I definitely get a conscious contact when I'm doing my yoga. I suppose my breathing slows down my head stops to spin, I'm completely in the moment. Definitely kind of just gives me a sense of being in my body, in my space, feet on the ground, in the universe right now, which I have problems with. So yoga's been fantastic for that. But what keeps me practicing more, I mean, simply put, is that it feels good. It makes me feel good. And it, and it, cl it calms me, it allows me to focus, it gives me energy. It seems to fulfill a kind of relationship with my body that seems eternal, you know. The first benefit, you know, going chronologically that I could identify was physically. I think in many ways I'm in better physical condition now than I was in my than when I was when I was in my 30s. I'm 51 now. And I feel that that 
has given me a, 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 a sense of well-being and I've had and been in pretty good health with not a lot of illnesses, diseases, colds or whatever. You know, occasionally I have a cold, but I can't so much identify it myself as other people telling me that, you know, I don't look my age or I look healthy or this or that. Sometimes that aspect, you know, the superficial aspect of it is not that evident to me. But internally, I feel healthy. And uh, the sense of flexibility I have with my body uh, is something that I've begun to really enjoy. For me, the first feelings I get from yoga are definitely physical feelings, not necessarily spiritual. It's that amazing feeling you get having stretched uh, and feeling taller and lighter and longer and just a bit more kind of free. You know, the, the spirit, I'm sure I have, well I know, I have a million miles to travel on the spiritual journey of yoga. I'm just a baby. Um, and I suppose my, my self-centeredness is all about, oh, I'll be losing a bit of weight here and this must be making my tummy look flatter and, you know, I'm not so hunched up. So it's on that level that I engaged with it, definitely, that it was going to be good for me and it was going to make me look better. And then the feeling better, or the, the spiritual feeling, has come much later. I discovered Iyengar Yoga at the YMCA. I mean, Marcel was teaching a class. <laughs> she was really tough. And I don't know what it was. I mean, every time I'd finish a class, I felt better. I just, every time. And some of it was horrible and she was kind of mean and, <laughs> you know, it's still, you know, I, I kept going, I'd go every day. The strength of the program is actually one day at a time, okay? But when you talk about yogic discipline, it is now, one moment at a time. One day at a time. I and mean, that's the other thing that's so key in 12-step recovery is that it's just, it's just this moment. Can I get through this moment? And, and, I, and sometimes I bring that into my yoga practice, into my, asa, into my um, practice of the poses. And I, if I'm holding a difficult pose or if I'm working on a difficult pose, I might think just just one more moment, just one more second. Can I do it for one more second? Or can I, can I just keep breathing through this adversity? I think a good way of understanding yoga and yoga postures and everything one sees about yoga, where people appear to be doing very difficult things with their bodies, which might be painful or might be just unmanageable, you know, for, for a lot of people. Uh, the, the, one of the most important things to realize about it, of course, it's not a competitive sport. It's not like gymnastics. You're not trying to appear good. It's not a performance art. It's something that you do to make yourself feel better. You can make yourself feel so much better on a physical level by doing yoga poses. Then the possibility of making yourself feel better on a psychological level becomes possible, whereas uh, quite often that's not easily accessible to people. And being able to cultivate relaxation and uh, calmness of mind. Um, a lot of relaxation techniques I learned in, from the Himalayan Institute uh, have been really helpful for me. Uh, most people don't know how to relax, either physically or mentally, and being able to help them to do that has been something that I've been working on, as well as trying to experience it myself. I try to meditate, to say my prayers and meditate every morning, even if I just look at my cushion for five minutes and wish that I could spend more time there. That to me is better than ignoring it altogether. And uh, Al-Anon promotes meditation. They don't give as much information as the yoga tradition will on how to accomplish that. But they promote it in a general way and they do uh, want you to cultivate um, focusing in on something simple to rest your mind in that place and to see how the disturbances that grip your, your, your perception, your soul, are not really that important. And, you know, that is like the Yoga Sutras in a nutshell. Yoga has taught me so many different type of meditation techniques and so many different venues for meditation. 
of uh, from very formal to walking and walking meditation I was never been able to do. But uh, I do like to sit and count breath. Uh, I do one in uh, Jenny's class where you follow uh, your breath in through one nose, out through from one side of your nostril out the other. And when I wake up in the middle of the night, I always do that. It's kind of nice. I love following my breath up, seeing it come out, as opposed to saying, what the hell did Christina mean by that? <laughs> Where did my mom say that to me? I go, one in, one out. <laughs> What the hell did that guy say when he... It's like, one in, one out. I know I should have charged more money for... One in, <laughs> one out. And it's just that quick, how my thoughts come in, go, and to follow my breath. You know, it's a mind-body connection, and uh, it's kind of hard to be all brain. I think the physical aspects of, of yoga just makes me feel good. And I think feeling better, feeling physically stronger, um, helps me deal with life stress. I mean, not that any 12-step program is a, a cure for anything. You know, it's just a, another tool out there to help me stay sober. And uh, I feel my yoga practice helps me stay sober. It makes me feel better. I feel strong. I deal with people. Uh, it reduces my anger, and uh, God, I'm so happy that I have it. The sober life, living a sober life, you know, um, in one sense, it's it's a natural life. You know, I mean, you, uh, 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 let's just say without alcohol, you know, because there's lots of other things that create an, an unsober life without, the, the, you know, the substance. Yoga has a stabilizing effect. Uh, one of the things that it brings about for everybody who gets involved with it is emotional stability. Uh, basically, people don't freak out quite so easily. And so one of the things that drives people to, uh, you know, their addiction is because of emotional disturbance. So. Uh, one of the difficulties with addiction is keeping stopped, it's no, lo it's no longer getting involved with the substance. So yoga, uh, I've seen my students basically uh, feel more stable and more uh, optimistic that they're going to be able to stay free. So yoga is, yoga was, is my step 11 because I'm quite frantic and hectic. Uh, and very rarely sit down to meditate, well, never sit down to meditate. Um, barely sit down to take time just to kind of be in my day. I go to yoga and that is my time and that is time for me to come back down to earth and to come back into my body. And I definitely make a connection with my higher power. I mean, those internal conversations that you have in your head, generally in yoga, those conversations are, at the moment, conversations about gratitude with my higher power. I feel so grateful when I'm doing yoga, like overwhelmed by how grateful that I am that I'm actually there doing it. I suppose it's because I love physical things. I just love that whole, oh, you just, it just makes me feel so good. As soon as you get into a practice like yoga, you start seeing the glimpse of where you're going to be. Because those few moments that lift you up from darkness into light, from a death-like situation to a life, from total denial to the truth, sets you free. I think maybe the way that yoga changed me, uh, psychologically changed my mind, my thinking, was that um, I became more self-accepting because uh, as I would do the asanas, there were days when I would just really feel wonderful and I'd feel very elegant and graceful and I could, I could move my body completely into the, the place that I wanted to go. And there were other days 
when I was stiff and sore and I was hurting myself and I couldn't figure out how to do it without hurting myself. Um, but somehow the, the accumulation of the experience gave me the, the, uh, the willingness and the ability to, to stay with what I was experiencing and not give up. And there were days, there were a lot of days when I would start my, when I was really exhausted and not feeling well, when I would start my practice with Shavasana. I would just lie down and say, this is, how, this is my practice today, I'm going to lie here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sometimes after lying there, I would get the, <laughs> I would get inspired to lift a leg and do something, <laughs> but it would start with that lying down and accepting that I was exhausted and not feeling well and not feeling fit. And um, self-acceptance is the, one of the primary components of a recovery from addiction because you, you really have to accept that, um, that you're not, first you're not perfect. A lot of addiction, I think, comes from the desire or the need to be perfect and the quick realization that you're not perfect and therefore you just, oh fuck it, you're just going to go eat something you shouldn't or you're just going to go masturbate and make it feel better and, uh, and just get away from it. And um, when I'm able to accept myself and accept that I am not doing well um, then the next step is I can usually call somebody and say, wow, I'm feeling really terrible, I'm dysfunctional today. And a lot of times after that sequence of events, the first accepting and admitting where I'm at, and two, reaching out to somebody, and sometimes it's, not a, sometimes it's just praying. I'm able to pray now and say, okay, God, help me out here. I'm not doing well. Sometimes it's getting on the phone and asking somebody for help. Through that sequence, so many times my day has shifted within a half an hour, things that were stuck suddenly start to flow. Okay, if, I, if I've got a good step 11, which is a conscious contact with my higher power, it, 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 that has ripple, a ripple effect throughout the rest of my life. It means that I'm in contact with that higher power, therefore I'm much more ready to hand my will over. It means I'm generally much more calm uh, because I've handed my will over, so it doesn't really matter what I do with my day, it's already preset. Um, and I just generally have a better day. And then comes the final step, and that is a psychosocial step. And that step says that having had this spiritual awakening, we practice these principles in all the affairs of our life. Now that is very true about yoga. Because you practice yoga, you can take that calmness, that serenity into every event of your life in the day. I, I think the way that yoga really helps with the compulsivity, that aspect of, of addiction, is that um, in the practice, I have made it my habit to, to begin the day with the practice. And there's a real difference to a day when I start, I turn on the computer and start doing emails and so forth before I've done the practice. Then it, become, it starts becoming manageable very quickly. And um, doing the practice, the first thing, I, I won't be honest, the first thing I do is coffee. I do coffee in the New York Times out of the house and then I come back and I, I do my yoga practice. And um, that makes me feel so good about myself that I have really taken care of something that's important first. And at the same time, it's sometimes difficult to do that. If there are a lot of things on my schedule for that day and um, I have a, I'm backed up with a lot of things that are giving me pressure, to take the time to do the yoga, sometimes my mind is screaming don't do this, don't do this, get to work. And, um, and to say no to that, and to say I'm going to do this practice first, I'm going to take care of my body first, <laughs> and take care of my spiritual life first, um, has given me, um, I think it's really kind of the answer to, to compulsivity, because um, 
yeah, compulsivity is about always following what's uh, pressuring you, what's calling you from this side and that side. And to not do that instead and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do the practice first is really powerful. I'm more present in my body. I'm, I can stand and, and receive without deflection from my, from my practice. Without, I can take that breath before reaction. There's distance between what's coming at me and, and how I re react. And I've learned that in my body. I've learned that from, from the practice. When you are there, yukta, yoga, in yoga, you get connected. You get connected with the center of your being. Then you recognize that you are living on the periphery of your being, pressing one another's buttons and reacting. Now, from the center of your being, you don't react, you respond. And your response is beautiful. The steps are really a way of freeing me from my um, habits, you know. And I think that, that practicing the yoga poses and the yoga breath work has, has been a real um, liberation for me, in my, for literally my body. And then, and then the mind and the spirit seem to follow. Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've worked all the steps now. Mm -hmm. And I work several steps on a, on, a, on a daily basis, or I try to. Um, step eight is, uh, is uh, made a list of people who, who we'd harmed, which was a very easy step for me. It was all there on my four, so I made my list of all the people that I had harmed. And I couldn't quite separate eight, step eight and step nine because step nine is about going to make amends to those people. So it was difficult to make the list because I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to say, go and see that person. I don't really want to do that, perhaps I won't put them on. But um, I did do quite a comprehensive list and uh, went through it with my sponsor. And then step nine was uh, going and making amends for those things. And that was also another life-changing step. I think lots of people find that step nine is a huge, huge step. You know, I made the most amazing amends to my mother. Really quite moving. And, uh, yeah, really quite magical making amends to my mother. Once a person has led oneself into a state of dispossession, Nothing has a capacity to upset the person. Nothing has a capacity to make the person, you know, feel good. He is not dependent, she is not dependent on anything external. He is whole and complete. And so you come from being. When you come from being, there's no problem. Before I came into recovery, I would never have talked to you about a higher power. I didn't have any idea what that was. I'd, I didn't have a problem with God. I wouldn't have said I was religious. But I did lots of Sunday school. I had lots of Bibles. I had a, quite a spiritual experience as a small girl once in, in my garden. And I was at, at uh, Sunday school and there was a, something, a reading, a story about asking God to come into your heart. And I must have been, I don't know, six or something. And I remember standing under a tree and saying, please God, please, will you come into my heart? And I had that, you know that feeling you get when you listen to an amazing piece of music and that kind of yeah, tingling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had this kind of body sensation and felt different. And at the time I didn't really understand it, but as I've reflected, I thought that was my first spiritual experience. So I, I I was too pissed and too mad and too out there trying to grab a pound note or whatever to ever follow a spiritual path. G 
getting sober, forcing me to slow down, forcing me to have a look at that relationship, because that's what they teach you in AA, it is a spiritual program, you don't get that spiritual stuff, it's likely you'll get pissed, was, it, I've had to do it. So, um, it's not, it's not, it's not been hard for me to to use the word God. I, I'm quite cheesy about who I say God to. I think yoga offers a sobriety of mind and spirit that is really beyond satisfying, beyond my own expectations and if I if I'm relying on a, a crutch like alcohol or drugs to give me some altered state of consciousness um, at this point for me it's just it's not even interesting it doesn't hold the appeal or the allure that it used to because I'm so clear on what um, where that takes me personally I think that I would not be the person that I am today if I hadn't had to come to terms with the fact that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And I didn't understand it when people said they were really grateful that they were alcoholics or drug addicts, but I am to totally grateful because I have had to reevaluate who I am and my life and how I am in the world. A drunken mind is, is in delirium, it's delirious, but a sober mind is, is in expansion, is in, you know, in terms of the practice, you know, what you get from a, a really wonderful practice is a feeling of wholeness and a feeling of extraordinary self-possession and that the energy in you is even and, and full transparent, porous, light, bright. When people ask me, um, is yoga going to help? They're asking me from a position of pain. They're asking me from a, from a position of having gone through some terrible, devastating, life-wrecking experience. And they're in recovery and it's not too comfortable. And, and, and my answer is yes, yoga can help. Of course it can help. It helps in conjunction with the 12-step program. And the chances are that you can be be successful with this and put your life back together and also come away with a tool which is going to help you develop yourself further. It's, it's, it's beyond recovery in the sense that yes one wants to stop, yes one wants to recover, right? but also one wants to go further into all those things that yoga can offer you. Basically, you know, tremendous physical health it can give you, emotional stability, and, and a tool that if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can explore your spiritual life, explore your relationship to your spiritual identity um, in a way that has been proven over centuries to be safe and uh, okay.